His museum, and it's referred to as the Edwin Smith Medical Papyrus, but it documents over 200 different anatomical terms. They were very sophisticated medically. Surgery was practiced, and even uh, uh, an early form of neurosurgery called trepanation, where you open the skull to relieve pressure on the skull. Mm -hmm. uh, exacting medicines were used, special prescription, subsidies, uh, rather uh, subspecialties that had arisen during this time, and obviously great philosophers during this time. What I want to emphasize right here, though, during this time, is that during this time in ancient Egypt is the discovery of the unconscious. The discovery of the unconscious was not the, the discovery of Freud and Jung in the latter part of the, of the, or the early in the latter, the early part of this century and the latter part of the last century. No, it was not. It was a rediscovery. And both, by the way, Freud and Jung said this. They knew that and they said so. But they discovered uh, the ancient Egyptians discovered the unconscious. One of the things that is important about the unconscious, if you're a clinician, you know that it's not enough to know that somebody has an unconscious mind. What it, You need to be self-aware that there's an agency of the mind that is influencing the behavior outside of awareness. That is the <coughs> unconscious element of the mind instead of just going along and having it. So it's a matter of being self-reflective, self-aware, deducing that it's really there. The unconscious in ancient Egypt is referred to in two ways. It's referred to as the amenta, or the all-black underworld of images, forces, beings, and symbols of the mind. It is a way to think about all these processes going on in the mind, arising and falling and influencing one's life and one's experience. Richard D. King, a brilliant psychiatrist, a friend of mine, it's written a book, The African Origin of Biological Psychiatry. And I would suggest any of you that are uh, remotely interested in this seriously to pick up a copy of this person's book. Also, uh, in ancient Egypt, the unconscious process is referred to as the primeval waters of Nun. There's an excellent uh, text called The Discovery of the Unconscious in Ancient Egypt by Eric Horning who refers to this over and over. So clearly, the unconscious mind is known in ancient Egypt. And they work with the unconscious mind, they use the unconscious mind in treatment with hypnosis, with dream analysis, pain control, and a number of other things. We have not really um, exceeded their technique. We've gone in different directions, but all the basic techniques of hypnosis you can find written in the early Egyptian texts. I know, I do it. And I teach it to uh, psychiatry and psychology interns. I'm using essentially the same basic ideas. I'm using different languages and different forms and so on and so forth. It's still basically the same idea. So during this time, there's a great deal of experimentation in art, in science, and religion. But two are extraordinary and reflect upon, can reflect upon our idea of a spiritual evolution unfolding from an African template. The first is the mythos and the spiritual drama of Cyrus. The second and closely allied is the transcendent bioenergetic phenomenon of Kundalini. It is literally the evolutionary energy in human beings. First, the mythos of Osiris, and why it is the greatest, I believe, and the most inclusive of all the great myths of humankind. But first, what's a myth, and what influence does a myth have on culture? Okay, not the literal truth. Because we all know whoever wins the war decides what history was. So myth is the collective, myth is really the collective memory of the race about what reality is. I assure you, if Hitler had won the war, we would have had a different understanding of what Hitler's history was, right? <laughs> myth is the living memory of meanings, formations in time, and what different forces mold our lives. We all have myths. We have personal myths, we have family myths, if you were to ask someone to sit down for five minutes and describe who they were very quickly, what you would hear mostly are myths. This doesn't mean it's not true, but it means it's not the literal truth. It means that's the way that they organize their understanding of themselves or other people. People have different roles and potentials and situations and families and so on and so forth. These are family myths. So we all have these myths and we live by them. If we don't have them, our lives are relatively empty. The greatest and most enduring myth of the modern age is the myth of science. Science is a myth. It doesn't mean it's not true. Parts of it are true and parts of it are not true. Science is changing its mind every week. What was an experiment, what was a medical procedure that you absolutely had to do 
five years ago, you don't do it anymore, right? So all of you out there who are worried about your prostates, just sit on it for a while. <laughs> So myth is really a multi-generational trans, multi transmission of vital meaning, I believe, the living tissue of implicate and explicate intelligence and human experience across the ages. Now there's a whole family of human myths, and each one covers a certain area of human experience. It covers it well and organizes our feelings about it and our understandings, uh, our insights, our conflicts about it, but it makes it intelligible. Oedipus and Electra, both of those are ancient Greek myths, describe certain situations that occur in family situations, particularly family dynamics. Uh, Oedipus, the story of Oedipus where he, he's afraid of marrying his mother, so he escapes and but ends up eventually marrying him. That it, marrying his mother and so on and so forth, that's about the dynamic tension, sexual tension between mother and son, okay? And Electra is the same situation, but that's between father and daughter. Those, that's what's called a fa in psychiatry, psychologists which refer to as the family romance. It's quite normal, it's quite healthy. It's just when it gets out of bound, when the boundaries are crossed, the totem is crossed, that's when you have a problem. But that's a normal relationship, and in fact, if it's not there, you don't make a bond with the, with the parent in person, so you have to have that. The Midas myth, another Greek myth. And this is about greed and downfall, where Midas has it all anyway. They want more. One spirit, Icarus, and his son somehow are on an island, and they need to escape. They are intelligent, and they figure out that they can escape this island by using wax and discarded bird feathers and making wings for themselves. But father tells son, make sure you don't, you don't fly too close to the sun because it will melt the wings and will crash into the sea. So they, through their intelligence and cleverness, they make wings, and they begin to fly off, and they're heading for a shore, and the sun becomes what's called in psychology and psychiatry ego inflation. He feels so full of what he's done that he flies too high toward the sun. The sun begins to melt the wax, feathers come off, down into the sea he goes and dies. The father, keeping it predictable, keeping it steady, close to the ocean, he gets to the other side of the shore. So that's about the fall based upon pride. A Semitic myth. The myth of Job in the Bible. Here's one in which Job, a nice person, God decides, I'm going to test him. <laughs> and sends all kinds of bad news things to Job. But Job, even though he doesn't understand why this is going on, doesn't lose his faith. And because he doesn't lose his faith in God, even though he doesn't understand it, eventually he, he is redeemed and gets back everything he did before plus more. It's going to triangle and eventually leads to the downfall of all three. The story of the Camelot. Okay. I'm sure some of you can relate to that. <laughs> uh, myth of Beowulf. <laughs> the myth of Beowulf, where uh, a heroic, another hero, has to demonstrate courage and heroism and go and slay a beast. Okay. So you find a lot of those myths. Let's turn to West African myths. West African myths, at least from my point of view, are very direct expressions of deep psycho-spiritual dramas. There's the story, and in some cases the myth of Oromila, in terms of the creation story, the Genesis story. Um, Oromila is a long involved story of how he creates, unfolds the world, but is it literally the story of Genesis, how all of this came to be out of nothingness, or apparent nothingness. Oromila's other names are Witness to Creation and the Master of Expansion and Contraction. For those of you who are interested in physics, you know that a great deal of, of cosmology today is explaining this whole big trip about expansion and contraction. The Big Bang Theory, is that the one? Or is it a constantly expanding universe? Or does the universe expand and then contract? Essentially, that's what it's about. And there are all kinds of complicated formulas, but nobody really knows. <laughs> so at bottom, it's still a myth, because we don't really know, despite the scientific quote-unquote data. Mustn't be too seduced by science, have a healthy respect for it, but not be too seduced by it, because again, it changes its mind on its significant beliefs every 40 years. <laughs> the stories of uh, the Yorba's Obatala and his Ashe 
it's uh, ashe or power.